and sisters, your world and my world's exploding. Do you understand that? Did you hear the news tonight? This world is exploding. Do you know there are over 2 billion Muslim people in the world? Far in excess of 2 billion. Not 2 million, 2 billion. Think of that. That's the, that's the population, the, the, the uh, Muslim population of the world. They're divided between Sunnis and Shiites, okay? The Sunnis are, in a, are a greater majority than the Shiites. But where are the Shiite majorities? In Iran and, 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 and uh, Iraq. Iran and Iraq is where the Shiite majorities are. Iran is 92% Shiite, and across the Gulf, Sun, the Saudi Arabia is 98% Sunni. And they're out to cut each other's throats and exploding in North Africa. All the refugees are fleeing across the Mediterranean, some of them dying in the Mediterranean Sea. There are refugees fleeing all over this country. There's a crowd out there off of Thailand at the moment. They've got turned back the boats and they're out there at anchor at sea, hundreds of them, brothers and sisters, being, of course, treated harshly by, by those who, who supposedly are going to bring them to safety. Bangladesh, that's where Reggie Liz go, OK? On tonight's news... They're the Sunnis and the Shiites are firing at buses going past when there's a majority of the other ones in the bus. Can you think of that? Eleven of them got shot in a bus just going past in the street. And the streets of Bangladesh are filled with people protesting because the government's doing nothing about it. Do you honestly believe that this country is going to miss out? Brethren and sisters, tighten your belts. Because I'm telling you, it's coming. It's coming all over the world in every way. It, everywhere you look, it doesn't matter where you look, whether it's economic, whether it's political or, or ecological, it doesn't matter. This world is rushing to an enormous crisis. And we pray earnestly that our Lord shall come. My word, brothers and sisters, we need to be very, very careful what we're doing in future. We need to keep this meeting together. We need to be ready to help each other. Believe me, I don't want to be an alarmist, but anyone with any brain in their head just listening to that radio will know that this world is just about ready to blow apart. But we've got a magnificent chapter here, Isaiah 40. Prepare ye the way of Yahweh, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This, this is a beautiful chapter, brothers and sisters. And there's no question about it, it's dealing with the work of John the Baptist. It says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is that which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of Yahweh, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. He was a living desert. He was, he was almost like Elijah. I say almost because Elijah had a leather coat. His coat was a camel skin. It completed the picture, didn't it? A desert. Prepare ye the way of Yahweh. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So this chapter is about the work of John the Baptist, brothers and sisters, about other things as well. But we need to correct something. We need to correct the translation of that verse. You see, when you read that verse, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of Yahweh, that means to many people that, you know, nobody's listening. It's like people say, you know, when they can't get people to listen, they say, ha, oh, I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. They quote that verse. The meaning is exactly the opposite. Because that translation is not very good, the King James Version, not, not very well put. This is a better one. That's wrong. This one is a better one. A voice cries. In the wilderness prepare the way of Yahweh and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now you see the difference? Take the first translation. We could interpret that, oh, I'm like a voice crying in the wilderness. Take the second translation, which is of course supported in the RV, the ESV, the NIV, Rotherham, and appeared exactly like that RSV translation in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And when they put out a, an article in, in a paper in Sydney, on the, on the front page of that was a photograph of that verse just like that, on the Dead Sea Scrolls. So instead of being a voice crying in the wilderness and not making any impression, 
you've got someone out there in that wilderness with you and there are no distractions. There's no football match going on. Nobody's got a, 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 a phone, a mobile phone, or a pad, or whatever you call it. Nobody's got it. You're just out there, and there's no distractions, whatever. So whatever you say goes down deep. And that's the whole point of that verse. As I say, exactly to the opposite of how many people quote that, the opposite direction. It's exactly the opposite to that. So if we want to hear God, brothers and sisters, you've got to get out into the wilderness. Now, we know we're not talking about a literal wilderness, of course, but you've got to get distractions out of your head. If you want to understand anything about that book, believe me, you've got to sit down at your desk and get all the distractions out of your brain. Because this takes all the concentration in the world. There's a beautiful voice speaking here, but you won't hear it with all distractions around you. Now, I've learned that over 60 years, brothers and sisters. I had to learn that to get everything out of my head if I want to understand this book. And you'll understand nothing until you do. So this is what we've got to do. Why? Because, you see, it says, speak comfortably to Jerusalem. The margin says, to her heart. Speak to her heart. See, see the point? So there's a husband and wife dispute. They don't want everybody around them and distracting their attention. They want to, they want to make up that, 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 that quarrel, whatever it might be, or, or a brother or a sister, whatever. You don't need distractions. You just need to go somewhere quiet and just reason that matter out carefully when nobody there is to distract you. Now look at this quotation. Hosea, married Gomer, a harlot, commanded to marry her. By God. Why? Because he wants Hosea to understand what he had to do when he brought Israel out of Egypt. Because if we read Ezekiel 20, we read, brothers and sisters, that when Israel came out of Egypt, they were spiritual harlots. Oh, the record doesn't, doesn't altogether say that, the historical record, but Ezekiel tells us that. And yet God took that people in that condition, he knew all about that, and he took them unto himself and he led them into a wilderness. And he had to do that for 40 years in a waste howling desert and still never got through. Well, this man is married to a harlot. They have a little boy, Jezreel. God sows. He's the only legitimate child they had. She left home, goes out into the world and has two illegitimate children in the world, committing adultery with all the, all, all and sundry. A terrible woman. And this man went and got her, brought her home and put him in the house and said, look, sit down, love, I want to talk to you. Now he says, you're not going out of this house. I'm paraphrasing now what's in Hosea chapter 2. He said, you're not going out of this house. It's going to be between me and you only. And you're not moving until we get this message home. And Hosea picks that up. God picks it up in Hosea, brothers and sisters, and this is his experience. Because this is what Gomer, this is what, what Hosea and Gomer were undertaking under tremendous duress and pain and sorrow. This is what God was doing. He said, I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them. And she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels. Think about Gomer out there in the world. And she went after her lovers and forgot me, saith Yahweh. Therefore, Behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak to her heart. That's exactly the same expression as Isaiah. And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And you know when Hosea sat that woman down in that home and spoke these words which were taken up by Yahweh himself to express his feelings, he not only told that woman that she's not going anywhere until this is fixed up, 
He says, you and I are going to live separately in this house. And they went off at night, brothers and sisters, into separate rooms, into loneliness. They were in a desert. When they got together, he said, now look, love, I want to tell you something. And nobody was there. This is what Isaiah 40 is all about. That's why John, out in the wilderness of Judea, and you know when he claimed, they say, who are you, the Messiah? No, are you the prophet? No, 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 who are you? He said, I'm a voice. He claimed, brothers and sisters, nothing else but to be a voice. And what a voice. Can you imagine what it was? Is it, anyone ever done any speaking in the open air? I have. At Elder Park, we used to do it. You're shouting to get to people about maybe 10 or 15 yards away from you in a crowded place along, along the River Torrens there we used to give lectures. He was giving lectures to people spread along the tops of Judea and he's down here in the desert and they would have heard his voice all along there. Never heard a voice like it in their life. And it was deathly quiet, wasn't it? What's down here? Down in the Jordan Valley by Jericho. Absolute desolation. Here's a man dressed like a camel. He's everything a desert is. But my heck, his voice is echoing in everybody's ear. And he's allured them out there, brothers. They came from everywhere. From North Israel, from South Israel, they came to hear this terrific prophet. And he was to tell them, brothers and sisters, about the hope of Israel, the hope of the future. Now what's he going to say to them in Isaiah 40? Speak ye comfortably or to the heart of Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is finished. Her iniquity is pardoned. And she's received of Yahweh's hand double for all her sins. Now you've heard this saying, haven't you? Enough is enough. And here's Yahweh's promise to this people. If only they will listen and get rid of distractions in their life. Speak to the heart of Jerusalem and cry unto her that accomplished is her warfare. This is Rotherhead's translation. That accepted is her punishment. That's enough. She hath received at the hand of Yahweh according to the full measure of all her sins. And you can just picture the scene, brothers and sisters. We're watching it build up now. Soon it'll come. Russia conquers Europe. There's a liaison between Russia and Europe. The Pope takes a prominent part. The war machinery of Russia is on the move. It charges down through Turkey into the Middle East. It blasts the lands of Israel, gets into Jerusalem and kills, kills about six million Jews. Two thirds of them. And Jesus comes, smashes them to pieces. And, Yah and, he, and by the word of Yahweh, he will say to those Jews who survive, enough is enough. Speak to their heart. Show them his hands and his feet. And for the first time in their history, there'll be a genuine repentance in Israel. Isaiah said again in another place, instead of your shame, double. Instead of disgrace, they shall shout in triumph over their portion. Therefore in their own land shall they possess double Joy, age abiding, shall be theirs. Double! How do you double or switch? Treblinka. All those camps in Germany. Double! Double, brothers and sisters, the blessing coming upon that people. When you think about the horrendous history of that people, the things that they have been subjected to have been unspeakable horrors unspeakable Horace God says enough is enough and he'll call a halt to it brothers and sisters very shortly and that people will rise to greatness throughout all the world and everybody will want to see the king in Jerusalem when they hear and the smoke of Armageddon is blown away and people pick themselves up out of the rubble of the earthquake dust themselves down and hear there's a great king and his name is Jesus Christ is reigning in Jerusalem. I want to go there. I want to go there. How do I get there? You've got to go with a Jew. Really? They shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. The Bible doesn't say the seed of Abraham. 
doesn't say a Hebrew, doesn't say an Israelite, a Jew. And people spit that out of their mouth today. Double. Double. And God will reverse all those horrors, brothers and sisters, and outdo them twice over. It's just one of the most wonderful pictures we could ever possibly think of, brothers and sisters, in the scripture. Now let's read what Isaiah goes on to say. It says here in verse 4, And every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. Get the picture? A desert, right? We had a photograph of a desert up there as a frontiest piece. It was a little bit mountain. That's actually where John the Baptist was. That was a photograph of Judea. It was all these little hillocks. But you just picture, brothers and sisters, everything is level. Now, I'll read that again. Every valley shall be exalted. It comes up. Every mountain is going down low. The crooked will be made straight. And the rough places plain. There are four classes, aren't there? Here they are. They all come to hear John the Baptist. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That's bringing a mountain down, isn't it? The common people were there. Who were they? They were the downtrodden. And the people ask him, you know, imagine him calling from the heights of Judea. He's standing down there. It was like, a, like an amphitheatre. And this gaunt figure standing there in the desert, eats locusts and wild honey and dressed in a camel skin. He's got nothing. And the people call out, what shall we do then? He says, he that hath two coats, give to him that has none. And none of them would ever put his on. They wouldn't be seen dead in what he was wearing. And he calls us out of that crowd up there. Some of them living very well, some of them not living so very well. But none of them would have been prepared to equalise, would they? The publicans. Who are they? Tax gatherers. And they were as corrupt brothers and sisters as you could ever imagine. Hated by the Jews... Some of them were Jews, they were hated by the Jews and they were as corrupt as they come. So they come to be baptised. What are we going to do? Don't be crooks anymore. Don't exact any more than what's appointed you. You see, John the Baptist got to the heart of the matter in the desert. He got to the heart of the issue when everybody was there to hear. And no one was going to distract him because they'd never heard a man speak like this. And the soldiers were there. Likewise, they demanded of him, saying, what shall we do? Now, these are soldiers he's talking to. Do violence to no man. Wow. That's a pretty big issue, isn't it, if you're a soldier? And, of course, one of the big issues in those, in those days, as not so much now because it's regulated, but in those days, what the big issue was, who pay, which nation pays the, the most... For, for the people to fight with them. So it was all a question of money, like it is today. Money! There's your four classes. Now, when you look at them like this, they were all level. Every valley shall be exalted. The common people were brought up a bit. Every mountain shall be made low. The Pharisees were put down. The crooked were made straight. The tax gatherers were told not to be crooked. And the rough places were made plain. The soldiers were told not to do violence. There was a levelling, brothers and sisters. There was a levelling all among those people. You know, there would have been many people went home, trudged home at night when the sun sank down into the Mediterranean. They walked up, away from the heights of Judea, from way that vast gulf of the Jordan Valley. And there would have been a lot of heart searching going on, wouldn't there? And everybody got straightened out. John the Baptist went right to the issue with every group, right to their heart in the desert. 
and he was genuinely making an appeal to them all to make dramatic changes in their life. That's what that all was about. There's no doubt about that. Now we read this in verse 5. Look what it says here. And the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Now, if we just imagine that the coming of Christ, and, and this means that he will be, of course, visible to all the world who wants to see him, of course, that's not what it's saying. Because the word there together means unitedly. You see, brothers and sisters, there's nothing more powerful to unite two rival parties when they've both got to confront someone greater than themselves. Because their opinion of each other, which is the cause of, of the argument as to who's the greatest, disappears in the presence of one far greater than themselves. Now, the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed as part of that verse. It's in, it's in this verse here, brothers and sisters. That's what Isaiah said. The glory of Yahweh shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Well, it was revealed, wasn't it? Here it is. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's going to unite everybody who believes in him. Because, you see, when you're confronted with him, nobody's really great, are you? you, you all the grandeur you might think about yourself. We all, we're all proud people. People say you're a wonderful person. You believe it. And you run around as if you're the king of the universe, but you're not. And when we're confronted with that man, brothers and sisters, everyone is going to be united in that group because nobody's going to feel superior. Now look how Jesus did it. Just watch what he did. Now it talks about all flesh. Now he took the two extremes straight after that chapter. In the third and fourth chapters of John, he applied that principle of Isaiah. You look what he did. Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews. A ruler of the Jews. You're a master in Israel. This is what he got told. God loves the world. The world to Nicodemus, brothers and sisters, was a pigsty. That's how he viewed the world. Oh, he was a bit milder, I suppose, than most of the Pharisees. But as a Pharisee, representing the Pharisees, they wouldn't spit on the world. God loves them. Woman of Samaria. She's the opposite end of the scale, isn't she? She's a Samaritan. You know what Samaritans are, don't you? They're a mongrel race. Mongrel in the extreme. Taken away, of course, by Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, took all the Jews out of the land back in 721, put all back in there, all the mingled people of the east of it, who worshipped five gods, like this woman had five husbands. And now they've been inter intermarrying brothers and sisters and they're producing mutes and I have seen them. I've been on top of Gerizim at their synagogue up there with, with grown-up men coming up on skateboards, propelling themselves along on a rough cobblestone road, all their hands gnarled with scars, and they're all, mm, 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 mm. they're mutes because they can't talk because of interbreeding. And they're still there, and they passed a rule some years ago, and I've got a copy of it at home that appeared in a magazine. They passed a rule saying that if any man wants a wife, he can't marry now somebody in there because they marry their own, their, their own kid, their siblings, married in families, they intermarried in families. That's what's produced this people. Now they've got to go to Europe and other places to get a wife and bring her back there. That's the law of the people being governed who are about 400 families still up there on top of Gerizim. And when the Jews went left Jerusalem to go to the north up to Galilee, they would go all the way down to the Jordan Valley they would cross over the Jordan and go up the other side and then cross over back 
and go into Galilee. They would never go through Galilee, go through Samaria. They hated the place. It was a stinking mess in every way. And what did Jesus tell her? Salvation is of the Jews. She certainly needed a wilderness to hear that. If you, can't, if you haven't got the point yet, just reverse the order. Fancy telling Nicodemus that salvation is of the Jews. He'd go away another ever as taller than he was when he came, hating the people of the world even more. And if you'd have told that woman of Samaria that God loves the world, she'd have got and married five other husbands. But a proud Jew got told that God loves the world. And a deeply immoral woman got told that salvation's of the Jews. Now when those two finally absorbed that message, they were united. The glory of Yahweh had appeared and in the time that ensued after that, that incident with Nicodemus and the woman, we, both, we know that both of them embraced the truth in Christ Jesus our Lord and probably we'll see them arm in arm in the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, you could just imagine him saying to the woman, you know, I never realised that God loved the world. And she will say, I never realised either that salvation was of the Jews. And they're united. A bigger issue has come along, hasn't it, brothers and sisters? A far, far bigger issue has arrived. And this is the levelling leveling that's going on, of course, in this, in this particular place. Now, come to verse, verse uh, 6. And the voice said, cry. And, and he said, well, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. You see the point? We've just been through that. The four classes, the two opposites, with all their idiosyncrasies, their biases, their hatreds and their loves, their world's poles apart even their occupations, but they're all now united. Why? Because they've seen that all flesh is grass. Not some of it. There are not some people who are grass and some who are poppies. It's not like that. All flesh is grass. And that's why Jesus was baptised. Because he was born into the world, brothers and sisters, as grass. Because he was flesh. His mother was human. And though his origins were, of course, go a long way back to eternity, he came into this world just exactly the same physical constitution as you and I. To die for our sins. And you know, brothers and sisters, if everything we, if anything we need to get very, 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 very clear as to why he died. I hope everybody understands it. You should never be baptised until you at least fundamentally understand the lesson of why he had to die. He had to die to prove this point. It's as simple as ABC, and yet it's been one of the most contentious issues in our brotherhood ever since the days, the early days of Brother Roberts and even beyond. Never been out of the, out of the, out of the historical uh, section of, of controversy in our brotherhood. Never. Still going today. Because people do not understand that. But we're in a desert. We listen. We're down there with John. And Jesus comes. He's related to John. John knows him, of course. Doesn't know he's the Messiah. But he knew him. And he knew his, his background. He knew what sort of man he was. He knew he was an absolute wonderful person. He knew nothing against him. And when he was asked to baptise you, I can't do that. I just, he said, John, suffer it to be so now. Now you listen to what he said. For thus it becometh us. Us. To fulfil all righteousness. So Jesus is one of us. And why did he go to the cross, brothers and sisters? To fulfil all righteousness. You, you know what that means? It's as simple as ABC. 
He was grass because he was mortal and it's his father that made him mortal. He was born of a woman. She's mortal. She's going to die. God introduced that law in the Garden of Eden because of sin. And everyone born of human parents is biased towards evil because of what they did, not because what they were born with or made with. They, weren't, they were made very good. But they decided to go that way and they biased themselves towards that way by their practice and they passed that on to all their posterity. Now God says, I'm going to put you to death. Is that right or is it wrong? It was dead right. It was right that the death sentence should be given. And Jesus said, John, we are on the earth to prove my father to be right. And he died, brothers and sisters, the death of all other men and women to prove that his father is right because his nature is biased to sin. That is not, not sacrifice for nature. That is a nonsense. It's the sacrifice of the nature. It's gone. And the resurrection will not produce an improved mortality. It will produce a new, a brand new body, brothers and sisters, which has no relationship to that one. And when Jesus did that, it gave his father the opportunity to forgive every man and woman of the most heinous crimes they might have committed. But if they fall on their face in humility and confess their sins and pray for forgiveness, brothers and sisters, it gave God then the opportunity to forgive men and women without compromise. That's the issue. That is the issue. Jesus died so that his father didn't have to compromise. So we go into the kingdom. We're unworthy of the kingdom. We are unworthy. We shouldn't get eternal life for the things we've done. And we've done nothing that we can undo that. We can do nothing about it. But he did. Jesus did. And we're in him. And the father can look at his son and say, well, he did nothing wrong when I raised him. I was right. I was right to do that because he didn't do any evil. He was perfect. But he couldn't say that of us. So we've got to be in him. Thus it becometh us to fulfil all righteousness. We can't fulfil it on our own, but we can in him. And that's what he was telling John. But, says the prophet here, flesh is grass, but the word of God endures forever. And so it does. Now we read here, in verse 7, the grass withers and the flower fadeth, because the spirit of the Yahweh bloweth upon it. Surely, the people is grass. You think about it. People are grass. The spirit of Yahweh, brothers and sisters. Oh, what can we say about that? It's, it's all that God is. It's powerful. It's absolutely pristine. It's perfect. When that blows upon grass, it's going to wither that grass. It's going to disappear. All flesh is grass. The spirit of Yahweh bloweth upon it. Well, here comes a wind. Watch it. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. What for? To get blown on. So he goes into that, led by the Spirit into the building. Now he went in full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit it covers a multitude of ideas, but in the main, brothers and sisters, it's a demeanour, it's, it's an attitude. It, it's, a, it's a a will. It's what you are, how you think, how you feel. And Jesus was totally with his father, totally with his father. But he went into that wilderness and a wind was going to blow upon him because he was born a piece of grass. And he went into there and this is how he came out. And Jesus returned in the power of the spirit. It survived. And he went out of fame of him throughout all the region round about. This is all in Luke's Gospel, you notice. Chapter 4, same chapter. He stands up and he says, The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me in the synagogue at Capernaum. At Nazareth, rather. In that synagogue, he stood up and said that. 
So the Spirit took him into the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit, but he came out with it. He didn't lose it. And he stood up and he said, the Spirit of Yahweh is upon me. It survived. Marvellous, isn't it, when you think about that? What a man, brothers and sisters, what a man. But if the grass withers, the word of our God shall stand forever. Here's Peter puts the two ideas together, doesn't he? For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of the man is the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof fadeth, falleth away, but the word of our Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which is by the gospel preached unto you. So he was led into the spirit, brothers and sisters, to do that. Now look at verse 9. O Zion that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. That's, chapter, that's verse 9. Very interesting, brothers and sisters. The gospel of God. The glad tidings of God. Here's the apostle. Opens up Romans with these words. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. So there's good news. There's good news that Christ is coming. There's good news. They're going to, some of our loved ones in the article of death are going to stand up again. They're going to be resurrected. There's good news. We're going to have our bodies changed if we, if we are approved of the judgment seat. There's good news. We're going to rule the world. But the greatest of all news is that we're all going to finish up at the end of the millennium. God shall be all and in all. That's where it's going to finish. And that that's too much for our minds to cope with. That's the third heaven where Paul said, I can't tell you. Our minds couldn't comprehend that at this stage, but they will. The gospel of God. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. That's what Paul called it at the end of Romans. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Now look how Isaiah presents the gospel of God. O Zion, that, this is the one from Isaiah we just read. O Zion that bringeth good tidings, the gospel. Get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem that bringeth good tidings. Lift up the voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Now notice your God, don't that. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. That publisheth peace that bringeth good tidings, the gospel of good, that publishes salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. See where the, what the gospel is a finale, brothers and sisters? That's the finale of the gospel. The spirit of the Lord Yahweh is upon me, because Yahweh hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. So he's your God. He's thy God. He's our God. The gospel says, I, my, my gospel, my gospel, my good news is God. The greatest news anyone can ever receive, brothers and sisters, is God. I want to show you something. See those words we just read? Some of them are in blue, right? I hope you, yes, they do look different up there. O Zion that bring us good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem that, that bring us good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Now you've all read that before. I want you to notice, good tidings, lifting up the voice with strength, saying to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Right, you got that? Now, brothers and sisters, that, that Hebrew expression, that bringest up the top there, is in the feminine. It's talking about a woman. Isn't that interesting? 
Now you look at where this got applied. The echoes of Isaiah 40, verse 9. And the angel, this, this, he's talking to Mary. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that, or rather he's talking to somebody else, I am Gabriel that stands in the presence of God. And I'm sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, let it be unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her, and Mary arose in those days, and went into the hill country with haste, into a city of Judah. Where have you heard that before? Here's Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she spoke out with a loud voice. Where have you heard that before? Blessed art they among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And fear came on all them that dwelt round about, and all these things were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. Brothers and sisters, they are loud echoes of Isaiah 40 verse 9. And it's two women, and one in particular, that's got the loudest voice. She called out with a loud voice. Exactly what Isaiah said. That's why that expression, that bringest. Who bringeth? Women brought it. Now the question is, why? Why didn't God make, bring that through a male? We know, of course, the, 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 the various positions that male and female take in the scripture. You would expect, wouldn't you? That that would be a male voice. You've been through this before, but this is what it's all about, isn't it? Jesus was born not of an earthly father, he was the seed of the woman. If he'd have been born of a man, brothers and sisters, he never would have done what he did. No man interfered here at all. That little girl was a virgin when she married Joseph. She'd never been with a man. But she's pregnant. That's God. Who then will be his father? God says, I'll be his father. We say, well, how? Virgin will conceive. She did. When's that going to happen? In the fullness of time. God sent forth his son, made of a woman. And the fullness of time didn't mean, brothers and sisters, at the right time of Bible prophecy. It meant that when you read Romans 5, it meant when Israel got to its absolute lowest ebb, got to the dregs of their sins, brothers and sisters, then was time him to come. That's when God went to work. That's the fullness of time. Why did he do it that way? For what the law could not do, and it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sin's flesh, condemned sin in the flesh. Couldn't be done any other way. That's why women heard the echoes from Isaiah 40, didn't it? And it was out of their mouth, brothers and sisters, that that application came. Quite remarkable, really. Now, verse 10 says, verse 10 says this, Behold, Adonai Yahweh will come with strong hand, and his arm will rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. Now, don't just note that, brothers and sisters. Let's read that slowly. Behold, Adonai Yahweh will come with strong, leave out the word hand, with strong, and his arm shall rule for him. Well, my arm is me. I couldn't ask my arm to rule for him. Who's him? That's part of my body. But here's an arm, brothers and sisters, that's an extension of him. It's another arm, but it's, but it's still him. You see the point that's being made. You see, this is what's happening. You see, you look at this verse. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of Yahweh revealed? That's Isaiah 53 and verse 1. Do you know who believed that? That's quoted in John chapter 12 when certain Greeks came up to worship at the feast and Andrew and Philip approached Jesus on their behalf 
And Jesus said, if any man worship me, him will God accept. He wasn't going to turn anyone away. And the chapter finishes up by quoting that verse and says the Jews couldn't believe it. But Greeks did. Chapter finishes up, but they could not believe, said Isaiah the prophet. For he says, for who is the arm of Yahweh revealed? Not to them. They didn't see it. They never saw that man walking around was an extension of God, stretching his arm out and becoming another person, in effect, represented that very arm of salvation. Never saw that. And he saw there was no man and wondered there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. You notice these themes running right through the book of Isaiah. And I looked and there was none to help. And I wondered there was none to uphold. And therefore my own arm brought salvation unto me and my fury it upheld me. So here is the arm of Yahweh, brothers and sisters. Here is the arm of Yahweh that will rule for him. Now you know we come down to the, this, this expression here. Verse 10. His reward is with him. Now this is the reward spoken of in the book of Revelation, brothers and sisters. I want you to notice the words that are in colour. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Behold, I come suddenly. That's what the word quickly means. It doesn't mean quickly, it means suddenly. And the word carries the idea, as suddenly does, of surprise. It's going to be a big surprise. And where will we be, we be standing, brother, still when he comes? Where would we be? Just think about that. That word still carries tremendous chill with it if we think about it. We can't, brothers and sisters, be good one day, bad the next. Well, we can't be good entirely. We know that. We make mistakes. We know that. But we can't act like a Christadelphian Monday and a Gentile on Tuesday. We can't do that. Because he might come Tuesday. And what are we still doing then? That word has tremendous connotations. Why put it in there like that? Because he's telling us, brothers and sisters, it's according to every man's work. It's according to every brother and sister's work. You know, brothers and sisters, we are going to need to put all our energies into this meeting. If you can't see it, you must be blind. There are several of our ecclesias at the moment struggling, brothers and sisters, with difficulties because they're being worn down by the age. Bible class, to some people, becomes boring. They complain about a speaker going over time. If he goes five minutes over time, they can't stand that five minutes. They can watch a football match for two hours with ardent attention or listen to some operetta or a picture show a DVD or something. No problem, whatever. No problem. Still, what are we doing? What's going to happen when he steps into the world, brothers and sisters? How will we find us? And I, look, I'm, I'm excited that Christ is coming and I'm fearful because every one of us are going to be faced with divinity. Anyone who says that, oh, you know, fear just means, or think again. Daniel had a visit from Gabriel that set him flat on his face, brothers and sisters. And flat down on the prostrate on the ground, he had to be lifted up by the angel. That's how he reacted. And he was a man that was greatly beloved. And who wouldn't want to hear those words when Gabriel said to him, O thou man, greatly beloved. They, those words, brothers and sisters, would be the warmest words you'd ever want to hear in your life. But we've got to still be in the position we were when we were baptised. That's the point, isn't it? And that's going to take some doing. It's going to take a lot of doing. We are in, a, in a, a world of change, brothers and sisters. I was talking to a brother the other night about issues. He's a prominent brother. He knows what he's talking about. And he was talking about other situations that he had, he had in come, it, uh, come in contact with in other ecclesias. And all you hear about is change. 
We want to change this and change that and change something else. No, we don't. The old paths are the well-worn paths, brothers. We don't want to change anything. We want to keep the truth. We want to keep it pristine. And we want to make sure, and it's your job, it's this ecclesia's job out there on the floor that's got this responsibility. You are responsible for who you put up here to talk about this book. So whatever we get, brothers and sisters, is going to strengthen this meeting, it's going to be out of that book. There is no other source of power. We don't have favourites and say, well, every brother's, you know, do, every brother is, you know, we love them all. We do love them all. Doesn't mean they can all do the same job as well as someone else can do it. They may be able to do something else better. Make sure, and it's up to you, because you're the one that ticked the paper. You're the people that do that. And it's no shame if a brother can't do it. He's just not suited for that. But there are brethren in our meeting, I can name them brothers and sisters, that you never see here, and I stand in absolute awe of them. Why? Because you watch a stranger come in that hall, you watch the two or three brethren go and talk to them. And they've been doing that all my knowledge of this meeting for 60 odd years, some of them. I've been watching them do that. I can't do that. It's not a question of saying, well, we've we got favourites, give talks. It's what you're suited to. And it's going to be the, the, the rise and all the fall of this meeting when we lose sight of that fact. That's my opinion. You may not share it. I certainly have that opinion. And I think, therefore, we've got to be extremely careful because when he comes, we're going to be what we are when he gets here. And there'll be no changing him. There'll be no appeals. You won't go to a higher court. There will be no higher court. He'll be the end of all things, brothers and sisters. This section of Isaiah finishes with a very, very wonderful note to it. He will gently lead those who are with young. This is a terrific consolation. You know, David got chosen for this attribute. We talk about shepherds leading the flock. Yes, they do, and they've got to do that. It's not all they do, brothers and sisters. He chose David, his servant also, took him from the sheepfolds, from following the ewes. They're not at the front. Great with young, they're struggling down the back. But the shepherd's with them down there. He, he's doing both things. He's out in front, he's running down the back, making sure that everybody keeps up. He brought him to feed Jacob, his, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that's a beautiful picture. There's a brother that's left the truth from this meeting. Tragedy. He was a shepherd, a notable shepherd up in the north. He's got his picture painted on one of Hans Heysen's paintings. He was talking to me one day and telling about the, pe the, 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 northern, the people up the north there who they, they still do it, I suppose, but now there's trains and, and big trucks. But he said they used to herd their sheep down to the cattle yards, to the, down to the south, to get, get, get them, of course, into the market. And they were told by the owners of those sheep they must be extremely careful because they've got, to, they've got to get them in good condition. It's money, isn't it? It's money. You've got to get them in good condition. And he said to me, you know, he said, John, he said, there's a lot of criticism about, they talk about the shepherds driving their sheep in the back and with whips. He said, it's just not true. He said, this is what they did, brothers and sisters, when a one of the sheep fell down. He said they would go to the front of that, 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 that flock of sheep and turn them all back, back past that one that had fallen down, turn them around again, and as he walked past the lame sheep, it would get up and go with them and pick him up and, and continue the journey. He said they did that repeatedly. Well, that's what David was doing. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And I'm known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so now, I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now don't think, brothers and sisters, when you read that, that when he says, I lay down my life for the sheep, he, he just means that. Because if he meant that, what's the good of a dead shepherd? 
A lion comes, the shepherd knows he's no match for it, but I've got to save my sheep. I'll give my life for the sheep. When the lion's done with him, the sheep are his mercy, aren't they? Jesus never meant that. He went on to say, which is not on that, not on the screen, he went on to say, I lay it down that I might take it again. So Paul recorded at the end of Hebrews, he brought again from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep. Now they've got him forever. That's the shepherd that we have. In Psalm 95, the sheep of his hand, the people of his pasture, that's back to front. It's people that are in your hand and sheep in the pasture. No, it's people of his hand and the sheep of the pasture and the sheep of his hand. And when Jesus came and said, I am come the good shepherd, he says, I, he said that I, the, shepherd, that the sheep are in my hand. None can pluck them out of my hand. And he went on to say, and none can pluck them out of my father's hand. There's two hands. So while the good shepherd has given his life for the sheep, knowing full well he's going to get it again, three days, three days, they got no shepherd. Yes, they have. Because Zechariah 13 says that he will smite the shepherd and I'll put my hand over the sheep. There's the other hand. They're never out of Jesus' hands and they're never out of God's hand. And this marvellous section of Isaiah's prophecy, brothers and sisters, finishes with that picture. So there are great lessons to be born here. Perhaps one of the greatest lessons for me in doing that particular study, I did it years ago, of course, but in regurgitating that, one of the great lessons I learned from that, brothers and sisters, is that we're all level. We've got to learn to be level. Not always, not hard, not always easy to do. But let's all be level. Let's be united. Let's forget about who can do what best. Just all be level and get on with the work of the truth and stick together because we're going to need each other, brothers and sisters, like we've never needed each other if this world implodes like it's imploding now. We're coming to an enormous crisis. And we pray that God will be all of us and that Jesus, our shepherd, will soon be here.